doing that now? All right, here we go. So um, the first fly that I'm going to tie is um, is one that we call little brook trout, um, but it's the Bozebuck little brook trout. There are a lot of brook trout flies around. Um, this one is particular for an area up in Maine. Um, there's a deep lake up there called the Ziskahaz, and there's a camp called the Bozebuck Camps. And um, a friend of mine uh, was a guide up there, so he uh, developed this pattern and it's been very very effective up there it's it's a bucktail pattern it it um so it it's a kind of durable one and it and it's an easy one to tie um i'm using a 7x partridge uh heritage streamer hook it's the cs 17s um but you can use a uh i i often tie this on a 4x sprite um hook but uh, I figured for the the um, demo on the on the uh, screen, it would be easier to see a bigger hook. Um, so uh, what I'm doing is I'm putting down a nice little base of olive Danville thread, and I'm going to uh, just get a nice base. This has a, a wool type body, although I have been experimenting tying this with uh, a mohair, a creamy mohair body. It's a little shaggier. And what I find is that in the water, it picks up a little bit more uh, reflection. So it gives you a little bit more, I guess, sparkle uh, when, you, when you look at it. So, um, so what we have is um, uh, a tail is gonna have three different uh, colors in it. Let me just get my three different colors. Oops. Try to have everything separated so that we don't have a lot of downtime here. All right, so the first layer of the tail is white, and I just used some white hen. Not a lot, just a little bit. Pop it off. And all I want is to have it maybe a gap's length. And then we go with black. The three colors of the brook trout fin. And then we go with orange. So you got the three colors there and we're going to have a rib on this fly. Of course, the, uh, the um, little bit of, of the mylar that I had ready to go is uh, decided to exit the, the tying area here. So I'll have to cut another piece. Um, I'm just going to use this is small. It's probably size 14 if, if, if it's on a uh, um, number scale. Some, some companies uh, do it by small, extra small, medium, and large. Others do it by a number. So um, I want the gold side to face out. And then I'm just going to tie this garbage in. And I really don't care what it looks like. And you'll see why in a minute. All right. Now, the next thing that I'm going to use is this uni yarn right there. It's um, cream colored. And I just get a good, a good. Uh, section of it off there. Now, what I do is I tie it in at the at the front, and then let me get this out of the way. Tie it in at the front, and then I work my way back, and I try to keep the yarn right on top of the shank. 
And the reason I do this, I, you could tie it in at the back. The only thing that I find that by tying it in at the back, you get a big lump at the tie-in spot. And so I'm just gonna bring it forward and then I'll wind it pretty much with touching. Once you get past the hook point here, you can really kind of steam forward. And you could also leave your thread at the back and just use the yarn to push the thread forward and it would keep each, each um, of the threads turns snug together. Um, but it, it's not that hard because these, this is, it's got a thickness to it. So you could, uh, you can pretty much play around with it. If you get a little bit of a gap, you can just adjust it. But it's a creamy color, uh, it gets wet. It's gonna um, absorb a little bit of this, of the water. So it's going to uh, help the fly sink a little bit more. But it's the color of the brook, brook trout's belly. And with this fly not having a uh, belly, a true belly, it is um, definitely very good to imitate that brook trout right there. Okay. So, and now you could do a lot of things here. If you like bushy, you could pick it out a little bit uh, like you would a nymph if you um, wanted a little more streamlined like I like it. The only time, like I said, that I go, that I go with uh, bushy is with the mohair. So I get about, with a seven X, I get about five, six turns, gold side out. I think I probably said this the last time we talked, but um, one of the things that I do when I rib, if I know I have one, two, three, four, five, five turns, if I know I'm gonna have five turns, I lay that first turn in and then I eyeball the middle and I try to get that third turn right in the middle and that will end up making everything kind of come together um, and make it look good. All right, so then we're gonna put uh, the throat on and the throat will be, I think I need a little bit bigger piece here. The throat starts with orange. And if you just take your thumb and spread it a little bit on the bottom, it'll give you a, a, nice, a nicer look for the throat. And then we we'll use a little bit of a black pen. You could use slapping, just something webby and soft. And then white. There we go. And you don't have to overdo it here with um, a lot of uh, of the throat. You don't want to have too too much, but you still, when it gets wet, it's gonna really uh, thin down a little bit. So, and then I just snip off the waves. Now. The wing is, is kind of cool. So the wing is a mixture of yellow and orange bucktail for the first layer. So I get a little bit of yellow out. And get the shorts out, and then I stick the yellow in the stacker. And then I get a little bit of the orange out. And I try to go with orange, not fluorescent orange. I have like 
I, I'm, I, I think I'm a, a bucktail junkie. Um, <laughs> I have orange, I have burnt orange, I have fluorescent orange, I have orange with you name it. Um, because <clears throat> we, get, we get a lot of um, mileage out of orange in the fall. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna take a little piece off of the orange. And then I try to take it from like the middle, right in here. That's where um, the, the bucktail is going to be the, the sturdiest and the, and the um, least thick. If you get it from the bottom, it's very, very thick. And if you get it from the top, it tends to um, be brittle. So I take the yellow and the and the um, orange and I kind of smack them together here. And they'll pretty much be mixed up. But then what I do is I just use this comb and I give it a quick one, two. And I stick it back in the stacker. What size hair stacker do you use, Scott? Um, I have this one here. This is an old Renzetti one. It's a large mouth one. Um, I have, uh, and I don't have it in front of me because everything's packed for the show, but um, I have a smaller one that Renzetti made. It's a little narrower, probably about the size of a uh, little bit. Um, narrower than a shotgun shell. Um, but I, uh, I don't know. I, I've got, some, I've got, I've got one of these really, really small ones. Can you see how small that one is? Mm. It's a really good one right there. It's an old Orvis one. They don't, they don't, I don't think they even sell those anymore, but um, not, if you're ever doing uh, nymph legs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Those are good too. All right, so now I'm gonna, I want my wing, I want it to go back just about to where the tail ends. So you can do this a number of ways. You can tie it on right like this. You can trim it and then tie it on. And that's the way I like to do it. I, I trim it. And then I hit the thread with just a little bit of wax. And I wrap one easy, then I go forward another one easy and a third one forward. At that point, I look at it and I make any adjustments that I need. Then I kind of crank forward and put some pressure on it. And then I have this thinned out uh, varnish, really thin. And I just give it a little, little taste of varnish. And some people will, um, will varnish that I'll show you, I'll do it with this one, I'll show you. So the next layer is olive bucktail. And not a lot, when bucktail, I find when bucktail gets wet in the water, it, it looks like twice as much as you originally wanted. So I kind of err on the sparse side. Okay, so line it up, measure it, snip it. Okay, now one uh, other trick in the book that some people do is they take their varnish and they just hit the tie-in spot with varnish. They lay it in place and do the same thing. One, two, three, and then they go forward. 
Now, the theory behind varnishing the tips, the ends, is that it when you uh, apply the pressure of the thread, it helps to compress the hairs a little bit more. And um, okay, it, it does help. Uh, I don't do it always that way. Now, the third layer, last layer, you take that olive bucktail and you flip it over from the inside to the out. And you get a little bit of the brown dyed olive hair. And that's the third the third level. <clears throat> and this side's going to have a little bit more, depending upon when they source this, it'll have a little more under fur, a little more fluff to it. And... So I got about this much here and it's, it, and I'm looking at it saying it's too much. So I'm going to play around with this and get a look, take some of it out. And then when I get ready to tie it in, I just twist it, measure it, trim it, lay it in place. And because there's so many uh, layers of bucktail, the head on this fly is gonna be a little bit big, but it's okay. So essentially there's your wing built up three levels. And then the last thing, okay, where are you? Uh, Oh, there it is. The last thing is uh, jungle cock up. And, and on these, we, we make them a little short. And we run them right along the side. Up, up here in New Hampshire in about a month, they will, we have all these trout ponds that you can walk into and you use a float tube to fish in. And up here, they'll stock the trout ponds with a helicopter. And they'll, they'll put these little brook trout fry in the trout pond. And if you're there the day that um, they stock it, you fish with this because those big brook trout just have a big lunch. They just, until those little fry can figure out where to hide, they, uh, they start to uh, um, get devoured by the brook trout. And they, it's, a, it's kind of a science. They know exactly how many, uh, per square acre to, to put in. The biologists say the, uh, they have a, it all done down to a uh, technical level that's beyond my uh, pay grade. All right, so that's the Bozbuck little brook trout, very effective uh, streamer pattern. Very versatile. We've had salmon take this, landlocked salmon take this. We've had uh, even bass, smallmouth bass will take this. So I'll put, I'll end up putting about three coats on this, maybe four. It, that first one will get sucked right in. So it's a nice little, uh, nice little pattern when it gets wet, really streamlined, and it really looks like a fry. 
And you can see how I got that throat tucked up. It'll really blend right in like a fin. It'll look right like a fin. So it's kind of a, we won't, we won't go fishing without this with us. We always have this. And the fun, and the good part about it, the fun part about it is a friend of mine was the guy who designed it. So, all right, so let's switch gears here. Let me just reorganize. <coughs> Anybody got any questions for Scott while he's getting himself organized? Yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't be bashful. Okay. Now I'm going to do, I'm going to do a, a pattern here. And uh, I like this because I get to share this. This is kind of a cool, it's got a, it's a cool story. And it's uh, it's really um, a neat fly. So I'm going to use a uh, 9x size two. You could use a 10x Kerry Stevens Stevens one if you wanted to, but um, this is fine. So this pattern is called Chuck's. Sturdivant smell. And there's a pond in Maine, right on the New Hampshire Maine border. And a friend of mine uh, bought some property and I went fishing with him there last year at a pond called Sturdivant Pond. And while we were there, we observed some smelt in the water and I got it in my mind. And what I ended up doing was I went back and I got my buddies out at Ewing to dye me some, it's, if, this is almost like a salmon color uh, feathers. And, and really what they do is they dye this orange and then they dip it in red and it comes out and gets you this salmony color. So I, over the winter, I had them do that. And then I gotten in my mind what I thought that smell looked like. And I developed this pattern. And last week we were out on the, on uh, the pond, the lake here real near us and didn't a 24 inch lake trout take this fly just like that and then a little while later an 18 inch salmon took it and these were big fish because when they filleted them they were taking about a, about an inch and a half of meat off each side so they were big big fish um so this is kind of a cool it's a it's got a neat story in and it's uh Kind of a cool pattern. So let me start with always about two wooden match head lengths back from the eye. Gives you a lot of flexibility. And you know, um, there's a school of thought that these long hooks that the the fish will jump and they will use the hook as a lever to pop it out of their mouth. And for the most part, you see the barbs on, my, on the hooks. We crush the barbs before we fish because the salmon, the landlocked salmon up here, they have very, very weak, sensitive, soft jaws. And if you, if you're, you get a salmon under 15 inches, you have to return it to the water. And if you damage their mouth, they will spend the rest of their life trying to trying to heal the wound on their mouth, as opposed to um, growing. And you'll see the, these these fish. You'll, if you recatch them, they'll have an odd like deformity of their mouth where they were trying to heal them, and they're they'll never have grown in. And we we do some weird things up here. So every year when the federal, uh, the feds stock the landlocked salmon, what they do is they clip a fin on the salmon that they, they don't use. And that, that's how they know how old the salmon are. So one year they'll clip a fin on the left side, one they'll clip a fin on the top, one they'll clip one on the right side, and then the next year they won't clip. And um, 
And so when we pull a, a salmon out of the water, we can get narrowed down about how old it is. Um, and you can tell right away if it's been, um, you know, not growing. So, so I get a, a nice base of white thread here. And I'm gonna go back. I use all these landmarks when I teach. I'm actually uh, getting ready for a three day fly tying show. And I'm gonna demonstrate this fly, but I'm gonna tie it as a tandem, a two hooker, um, because a lot of times the smelt are usually about three and a half inches, but sometimes they're a little longer in some of these big ponds. So uh, the, the two hooker really is a, is, is a good one that you can use. All right, now, uh, let me see. Okay, so the tag on this is copper tinsel. And I wish somebody would make better tinsel in copper than uni. Because the uni makes it one side is copper and the other side is blue. And it likes to delaminate sometimes. And it's always in the middle of a, of a demonstration or uh, in the middle of a fly you're trying to tie. And then the, the body on this one is going to be silver. So I have a tag. So I go back to about where the barb starts, tying in the copper. Then I move, advance my thread forward about four turns. You guys will get a kick out of this. I'll tell you that once I get this going. And then I want to have a silver body. I'm at the end of the roll, so it, it it's like fly line that you stored all winter. All right, so I'm going to work my way up. So I was teaching a class once, and the 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 mylar we use one side's uh, gold and the other side silver, and so we had somebody had donated a bunch of fly tying supplies for the classes, and so I had all these different uh, rolls of mylar. And people picked them up and we were getting ready to tie the fly. And I said, okay, we're going to um, have the silver side out. And I explained how to attach it and everything like that. And there's this one guy over in the corner and he's looking at me and he's looking, he's looking back at his vice. And I'm like, clearly something's messed up here. So I said, do you have a problem? He goes, yeah, I'm having a hard time with uh, finding the silver. And I said, well, one side's gold and one side's silver. So look at the gold side, then flip it over. And, and I kept going and I'm looking over and he's still working there. He, he looked, so finally I got walked over. He had, it was such an old uh, thing of mylar. It only had gold on both sides. So I felt bad for the guy. <laughs> All right, so we want a silver body. So we're just gonna wrap forward. And this is this is the thickest, this is size 10 or large. And I'm just gonna overlap a little bit. And usually about now someone says, why don't you use the rotary body of ice? I I I don't. I I like to feel that I'm getting this on the way I want. So I, uh, I, bought, I, I can do it faster than most people can do it with the rotary. They've done the, they've had a couple of times they've timed me and I usually blow them off by about six seconds. And um, you know, it's not a lot, but you get, you get used to something and you like to stick with it. Okay, so now I'm gonna come up
And then I'm going to just lock it off with two turns over, one turn in front, snip it. And then a couple more turns just to make sure it's in place. Now, copper, we got a tag. So it's right at the end. Going to get a couple turns on that. And then we're going to rib it with this copper. And copper is a really effective color in New England here in the Northeast. In the fall, a lot of our flies, uh, the bodies will all be copper, either embossed or flat. And a lot of these um, original old fly patterns that were developed had a um, floss body and they these tires over time changed them to copper because it was much more effective. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna do a quick two turn whip finish to make sure that I'm not going to lose anything because you know how it goes. If you lose your tinsel or your floss, you get the old razor blade out. Okay, now let me see. Let me look at my recipe. Okay, white bucktail under peacock curl. Uh, there's my peacock curl. Okay, so I'm going to get about four to six hurls. There's four, we'll go with six. We'll really beef it up because these are the one, these are the things that will, um, survival of the fittest, these will not survive. One good fish will destroy uh, these peak hurl. And the hurl on, on, on this fly is, to imitate a smelt's lateral line. So we get it up there and I don't trim the hurl off. I just lay it in place and wrap forward and then bring it back. And I don't really care anything more than having the hurl on the bottom. I don't care if it's spread out, sticking up because I can press it down with my fingers and I can get the white bucktail out which will be the next level where is it let's get the white bucktail out To the belly. Okay, same thing. Now these are big bucktails. Look at the size of that thing. Huge. All right, now with this one here, it's a little got a, a lot of kinks to it. So we'll. We'll stack it in the stacker. And you need the big stacker for this bucktail because it's, it's very, very big. And then I'll just cull out the small ones. And anything that's taken a, a wacky turn here. And then all I do is I roll them in my fingers. and it gets them lined up where I want them. Measure, snip. Lay it in place. And you can see right away, it brings the peacock curl right, it tames it, it brings it right in. 
So a lot of times people will agonize over that um, and you don't really need to. So long as the peacock curls on the bottom, the bucktail will, uh, will tame it. And then um, I put a little bit of the, of the um, head cement on it. Okay, now let me get my, okay, so we got, we're gonna have a throat. Okay, we're gonna have an underwing. So the next thing I wanna do is put an underwing down and we're gonna use uh, golden pheasant dyed red. And that's about the right length. And all I do is uh, I already packed that tool. So I'll take a pair of tweezers and just flatten the stem where the tie-in point is. Cause the, the, gold, uh, the golden pheasant, the golden pheasant, I always tell everyone it's a beautiful bird. It doesn't like to be messed around with. You ever try to use golden pheasant tail? It doesn't want to do anything you want it to. Um, I always tell people when you're getting ready to use golden pheasant, think the opposite of what you want to do, because then maybe your mind over matter, it'll, it'll allow you to do what you want. So I'll get this in place. And I want it to just curl over the end of the fly. I want it to stick out just a little bit and it runs right along the shank. And its fibers kind of cascade down. And then uh, I want to definitely hit this with a little bit of uh, head cement. Okay, yeah. Now we got to make a wing. And a throw. And the wing is going to be two of the salmon colored feathers on each side. So there's two right there. And I just try to take them off the cape from about the same place on either side of the cape. And, okay, so there's salmon color. And then I use this medium gray, medium done. And I try to get kind of a thin, thinner one because that's this is going to be on the outside, and all it's going to do is give it a little, a little touch of coloring. All right, now, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to line this up. Oh yeah, wait, I'm going to show you what I do. I'm going to take a little bit of gray hen and I'm just going to build a small post here. Upper post just helps the, uh, the wing to fit on really well. And then I can put a little bit of the white throat on. At the same time. Okay, and then I'm going to switch the red because we want the head is going to be red. Okay. So you're using the gray, the done color to just to 
yeah, it's, it's, the actual orange down a bit. Yeah, it's like a foundation. Yeah, it's just gonna um, if you were doing Rangeley style, uh, three and nine wings, you need that so it doesn't roll. But um, it this is also just it it helps um, kind of make this whole thing uh, really fit well together you'll see and i and i can do a little gluing what when we get to the wing mounting yeah and it it'll glue right to that all I've right since, since i watched you the first time i've tied quite a few of them and it yeah, you, excellent they were excellent too the ones i saw online i was like whoa those are great you won't want me to come on anymore you'll be doing it. <laughs> Well, in, to be honest, what I mentioning is when you said you put the salmon feather, the salmon color, the gray on top of it. Yeah, the gray is going to be in the outside. So I'm going to have two yeah. salmon on the inside. And then I'm going to I'm going to put the gray one on the outside. You watch, you'll see how it looks. Yeah, because when it gets I, I actually I tied. I downscaled it to a size six long chunk. And I tied it with four barge of feathers. Oh, yeah. And when I fished it, I actually watched the fish following, but they shied off because I thought it was a little bit too bright, the barge. Okay, yeah. I put, I put two black hackles to cover the barge, and within five casts, I had two fish. There you go. Yes, that yeah. one, just by dulling that colour down a little bit. Yeah. And that, a, a lot of... Um... That's you got to experiment with that because you're right. The the black line in the badger can be, you know, when it gets wet, it can make it look more, you know. I think maybe more dangerous for the fit for the fish to get close to it. So it, yeah, yeah. But putting that black heart on to cover it. it yep. Walk and add it. I thought, well, what a difference. Yeah. We we have a fly uh, pattern up here called the Ripogenus smell. And there's a dam up in Maine called the Ripogenus Dam. And and the and the pattern has uh, a blue, it has grizzly on the inside, two grizzly on the inside, and one blue kind of lightish blue almost sky blue on the outside and i started getting grizzly dyed so that it would what i called it was smoky grizzly and it was a little bit of a bluey uh tint to the grizzly and it the white wasn't as uh bright on the grizzly yeah. And um, and then we took the blue and we dyed the blue. We put the blue in, dyed it, and then dipped it in gray and just took a little bit of the bite, the shininess out of it. And um, I ran into somebody who went to, to college with the guy who designed the fly and he goes, where did you get those colors? And I said, oh, I had them dyed up. He goes, those are the ones that he had. Those are the exact same ones because the regular grizzly was too bright. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so I'm using the uh, tear mender to build the wings. So I'll take and put a little bit of the tear mender. Let me put some on and I'll show you. You can see it right on the end. And then I take the salmon color, put it on top, and just press it together. And then the gray. Yeah. Now, one thing that you can try to do too, 
and a lot of tires did this over over time was they would take the salmon and they would do what I just did the put the two together and then instead of making the gray extend all the way down to the tip they would have the gray only go three quarters down and so you would still get that salmon color at the end looking pretty strong, yeah. but you had the, bo the, the body would be muted a little bit with the gray. Yeah, it just gives you that little flash. Yep, and, and it, it, it is very effective to do it that way. Okay, so I got two wings there and, and they dry pretty quick. And then, um, what, I, what I, we've done is we've taken some regular mallard flank. And we dyed the mallard flank done. Just a little more gray than it really is. And all I can tell you is it's muffled. It mutes that gray and white a little bit more. And I think just to your, just like you said, Gab, I think it's very close to making the fly look more realistic. Wow. And we find here that on very, very sunny days, the salmon and the big lake trout and the big brook trout, they're looking right up into the sun for these, these uh, flies. And so we, if it's too, too bright, they, it just, they, they're not attracted to it. All right, now I'm gonna mount the wings. Now you can do it two ways and I'll do it, I'll do it both ways here to show you. I'll put a little bit of the tear mender on the inside of one wing. Then I'll line my wings up, my tips up. I'll lay this right on top and I'll put two wraps. And then I can do any adjusting I need. And then I'll go forward a couple wraps. And as I go forward, when I come up, I'm gonna snug it up just a little bit. And this is what we call Eastern tie. So it's not a Rangely style. It's gonna sit on top. And it's really, when this gets wet, I have a picture of it on my website. When this gets wet, it really, really, really gets thin. So the next thing I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna put your side mallard on. And what I do with these is, you can see how curved they are. Yep. I just snip off a little bit. so that it's not working against the, the hook at all. And it lays right in nice and easy. Gives you good shape. Okay, now let me just make sure I got everything here. Da, 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 da. Yep, okay, now. I'm gonna put on the jungle cock. And I use this fabric fusion here. It's really kind of the same as the, oops, let me get that other stuff off. It's really the same kind of theory as the um, tear mender, only it's not latex based. And I just put a little bit of it on 
so it sits right in there perfect on that on that mallard shoulder. All right. And then one of the most important things now is to kind of reverse trim. So take off your. Yeah, bit by bit. Yeah, bit by bit. If you go in and give it a one, a one time, it's going to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yep. You're going to be upset because it's it it's such a big snip it's going to um move the wing and you can also one of the things that i like to do is i'll take like one or two and i just bend them back and when you bend them against the thread they're easier to snip What's this actually called again? Is it the Gus Sertiman smelt? Yep, yep, Sertiman smelt. Chuck's, I have a friend. I, you guys would, might, well, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't know this, but there was a, there's a great um, salmon fly up in Canada called the Costable. And um, most of the Canadians, they, that's the fly. And this friend of mine, Chuck, last name is Costaboom. He's actually related to the uh, to John Costaboom, the uh, originator of that uh, salmon fly. And a number of years ago, Canadians came out with a series of stamps, postage stamps, and they used uh, the more popular flies in Canada. And one of them was the Costa Boom. And so I got one of the stamps first day issued and I tied the Costa Boom and I framed it and I gave it to my friend. And I got a email from somebody in Pennsylvania that said, I have some of Costa Boom's original body floss and I'm going to send you it so you can redo that fly with the original body floss and uh, so it really was a great you know it's, it was a great story and I'm going to do a couple whip finishes because the salmon up here will hit the head of the fly first. And then they'll circle on back and nail the, um, the, bot, uh, the back of it. They like to ambush the fly first and, um, and then they'll come back for the kill. So a lot of uh, the, uh, we always tell everybody when we're in the boat, set your feet when you feel it the first time because he's coming around, he's gonna nail it and that's when you're gonna catch him. If, they, if you start yanking on the first hit, you're in trouble. You'll be sitting there with nothing on the end of your line. And with these big streamers, you're gonna get this, this uh, varnish is really gonna suck right in on, make it nice. And when it gets wet, this thing's like a needle. It, it gets about the size of a pencil. All the material just sucks right down. It's a little bit big right at the, at the um, behind the head where the shoulder is. It gives you that bait fish profile. And um, it's really, it's really, we've, it's proven that it works. There are a lot of flies that look good. We develop them, we play around with them and they never catch a fish. Um, but this one right out of the bed, right out of the gate, the first day it caught one. So, so that's the sort of smelt. 
and then you had the little brook trout. And I'm um, happy to answer any questions you have or anything like that. The quality of those feathers looks fantastic. Thank you. Yep. Really well, do. Th there's a couple guys that have reached out from um, your neck of the woods to um, develop a uh, way to get these feathers. So I don't know where they are. I know, um, I know Derek, your buddy, Bob, uh, he's got some. And then there was, I think there's a guy in Ireland that was getting some that might be friendly with uh, Tim Wood. Um, and uh, they were getting, uh, they were getting this, this hen color for the uh, Irish wet flies. All right, so, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it just, uh, they can ship them over cheaper because of the way they have the customs thing. If I was to send them over, it's like forty dollars just to mail them, and and there's this thing doesn't even weigh. I know, weigh. I know I've seen it. I've I've looked through them and I thought, oh, that's a bit, bit tasty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if they can get a, uh, get a, um, you know, a shop or two over there to hold, to get them, they get them all, you know, in a big box, and it's a one shipping deal. It's a lot more economical. So. So there you go. You, you, and, uh, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't spell it for me. I, I, is yeah. it got a Chuck or Gus? It's Chuck. It's uh, C H U C K yeah. V S, and then it's Sturdivant. S T U R T E V A N T, and then Smelt. S M E L T, and then the S the first one was. S T U R E V A N T, stir of them. Yep. Yep. And the first one was the Bose Buck, B O S E B U C K, all one word, B O S E B U C K, Little Brook Trout. Magic. And, and uh, I'll volunteer again if you want me to. And the next time I will do um, a couple, I will do a stimulator that is more of a dry fly. Uh, and I will do what we call a hatching pupa. That is a, a really cool fly that works unbelievable. It'll work over with you. It's a caddis um, mayfly type pupa. And it's, it's, uh, it's really unique. You use you use the eye of the peacock. You erase all with an eraser, school eraser. You erase all the fibers off it. Yep. And that, and that is the that is the body of the fly with a little bit of um, wire, and um, it is got. It's got a tail of probably eight fibers of a um, of a uh, wood duck, and then after you got the body on and you rib it with the wire, and the wire is only on it for strength. We varnish the um, the body, and because you've erased where the um, eye of the peacock curl is it gives it a little bit of extra coloring. Yep. And then we take a, another piece of peacock, not from the eye, from further on down, bushy. And we put a few wraps right against the body. So you get a little bit of a um, fuzzy effect. And then we take a Hungarian partridge and we um, tie that on and we get like maybe two or three turns of that and we tie it off. And the peacock curl that's got the bushiness, that at actually helps to keep the uh, Hungarian partridge spread out a little bit. Well, you, you th and we tie them in 14s to 18s. So these are smaller flies and we, pop this baby in the, in the river or wherever you're fishing in the pond and we let it just sink a little bit and we take the tip of our rod 
and just go up like that. And usually the, your two hands, because it's, they're not on the surface and the fish are not being exposed to predators like eagles or hawks or any of the birds that could come down and grab them. And uh, they, they'll just, just hammer the thing. You don't have to set the hook, they set it themselves. And it's amazing. If you use the Sprite um, dry fly hooks, mm -hmm. I like them because there's the, the shank on the, on the Sprite dry fly hook is slightly longer, just a little bit. And it gives you a nicer bo looking body uh, and you're not crowding the head. It's not a big blob. It, it dimensionally, proportionally looks good and it looks like a hatching pupa coming off the bottom of the river or the pond. And it's, it's amazing what, um, what you can do with these uh, small flies, but it's a great pattern, easy to tie. Um, and we, we actually, we have this, we call it a bootleg wire. We have this wire in it, you, you can't buy it in the store. This is wire that you, you got, that we get from um, a uh, machine that's been, electric machine that's been broken. We go in and we unwind the wire. And this is so fine, you can barely see it. You can't, get, yeah, there you go. That's exactly <laughs> what we got. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, this hatching pupa was, was a fly that was uh, developed by a fellow by the name of Ellis Hatch, who's passed away. He was a great fly tire. And a lot of people have tried to imitate that fly and they imitate it with, you know, the uni wire. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's nine times too thick. Yep. And that little bit of extra thickness, the fly doesn't work. So, but, uh, I'll tie up a couple. Uh, I'll do a demo, and we do them in, we do them in olive, we do them in a brownish yellow, almost kind of dark gold, and then we do it in regular Hungarian partridge. And I don't know how easy it is to get Hungarian partridge where you are, but it's really hard over here to get good partridge because we got to get them small feathers. And I have a friend who owns a uh, hunting preserve. And so he stalks pheasant and he stalked uh, chuckar and all sorts of different birds. And this past year, he, he um, started stalking Hungarian partridge. So he would give me like 10 or 12 of these. They're small. They're not big partridges. And I would bring them home here and make sure my wife wasn't in the house. And I would dye them. <laughs> and... It's amazing. We could get we could get exactly the color we wanted, and it was perfect. So, uh, so I'll, I, Gavin, you got me. If you need me, you just let me know, and I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure uh, um, to do it to do that one as well. Right, deal. Right. All right. You always use jungle, or sometimes do you use resin eyes? No, nope, I always use jungle. Like that. Yep. Uh, I will paint an eye on the head. Often, uh, I'll show you one right here. I have it. So this one here is called a, this would be another good one for next winter to, to, to tie. This is called a 10 feather streamer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There are ten. There are ten feathers on top of each other. This one is is been fished, so it's kind of beat up. But you can see how I got the eye painted on that one. Yeah, I used to do. I used to do the same thing. Well, you and you, um, you, you I, I will show you. Go on. Can you can you see that other side where you can't see the eye? Right. Can you see that you can see the thread there on, uh, up close to where the feathers are? Yes. I don't know how well you can see that, but 
this that was a resin head right and they don't last they don't for some reason the resin doesn't work it comes i can peel the whole thing i right now i'm peeling i peeled both eyes right off it doesn't sink into the um to the thread it sits on top and in the water when it's cold it, it does something to the resin it doesn't work well um and and so uh the resin guys are all mad at me because yes. I, i've stopped using the resin it, it break it makes me makes me look like i have a sunburn um but what we do what the old timers used to yeah that stuff but we can't get that it since 9 11 it won't come over why well never because it, it it's flammable on the plane oh, every no. once in a while we get some so what i use is hold on so we used to we used to use sheffield varnish but well, I, sheffield, got, I got red i got yellow i got black yeah i got a, i got a black <laughs> um we used to use Sheffield varnish, but they stopped making it and, and sending it over. I don't know if they, it, it, it was made in Sheffield, uh, Great Britain. So now what we use is this Minwax brushing lacquer. And it, it's, the, it's, the same, it's the same thing. It's just got to, when you fill it up, it, you fill up your bottles, it, it smells for like two days in your fly tying room. But yeah. anyways. But this is a cool fly because it's got 10 feathers right on top of each other. And um, so it's like a flat wing. And they're all different colors. Um, you know, there's some repeats, but uh, when it gets wet. Watch the look. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that really beads down. And that one we do, we paint the eyes on. But have now... You, have, you, have you tied that flat or on the side? No, flat. It's right on top. It's flat, right. So it's... It ten right on top. And, yeah, and, it, and when, it, when it's in the water, it really, it looks, it looks like the back end swimming. That's it, yeah. And um, there's a fly called the 9-3. And it has uh, three flat feathers and then two that sit right on top of the flat. It, it's a bear to tie, but it's a really good pattern. It's all, it's a very dark green and then black. The two feathers on top are black, um, but it, it has tremendous action. And, um, but the story was with these, the 10 feather smelts was that you, um, you don't use these saddles, right? You use, um, a dry fly saddle because you need the narrow feathers to lay on top of each other. <laughs> and they used to sell these in the fly shops in used cigar tubes because they couldn't put them uh, in the little bags because they would lose their shape. So they had all these cigar tubes. And if you you could smell it smelled cigar. You would know if you had a good cigar, if you had a good fly by the smell of the, of the, of the cigar. All right. You guys good? Yeah. Great. Really good. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend. I will. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, have a good time tying flies and chatting with everybody. So all good. All right, thank you very much. You guys have a good night. I appreciate you watching. Cheers, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good morning. Uh, Scott, has Bob got a good selection? Two nights, Scott.